Hi. Greetings. How's everybody? Good to Bye. see you both. Yeah. Milton Alimade is the publisher yes, of Black Star News dot com. Right. He is a revered pan Africanist. Thank you, brother. He he's making a great impact and moving Africa forward. It's Thank my you. pleasure to welcome you into today's um COVID nineteen, the practical steps. Thank you. So it's always my, my pleasure. First question is this. <clears throat> what have you to say about Melinda Gates' comments? I see dead bodies in the streets of Africa. Well, it's not shocking, but what can we do? <clears throat> I mean, uh, you know, as you know, the image of Africa has been so demonized over the centuries that people take it as a matter of fact. They take it for granted now. So Africa, and not only Africa, everything associated with Africa, descendants of Africa, blackness is associated with all the negative uh, things. Uh, so for example, in the Western countries, whenever there is a crime, who are the usual suspects? Mm -hmm. Africans or people of African descent. And I'm sure you've had instances uh, similar to what we have had here in the United States in the past, when somebody commits a, 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 a serious crime, a heinous crime, even, uh, even a murder. If it's a European person, let's say it's a European American, there are many, many instances where they say they implicate a black person. And there are many stories of people of African descent being vindicated. But the mere fact that it's taken for granted, that all you have to do and it says that a black person did it, and it's widely accepted, <laughs> that shows you there's a certain mindset that the people that make those statements, they know it will be widely embraced by people that think like that. So we should not be shocked anymore. Of course, we repudiate, we reject. You know, it's completely nonsense. And what I always tell people is this. It just reveals your own level of ignorance. Because learn your history. Just learn a little bit about what Anta Diop taught the world. The original man, right, cannot be inferior to anybody else, <laughs> you know? Yes. You know, have some humility. We don't go around bragging and saying, oh, we are the original. Everybody else is inferior. We don't say that because we don't think in those terms. You know, it's not of our interest. We know that mankind started in Africa and then spread and inhabited and populated the rest of the world. And as they traveled, their features adapted to the physical, environmental conditions, uh, the elements in those countries. And that's why the features change to adapt to the climate in those societies. That's why we now have uh, people that are referred to as Asians, we have people that are referred to as Europeans, and so forth. But originally, they did not exist. And this is not to say anything negative. It's just a historical fact. Just go back and look at the history of the six species that evolved. Africa contains all the six. Everywhere else in the world, you find from the third state going to the six, meaning mankind must have originated only in Africa. So you're insulting yourself when you say something like that. It's nonsense. And if we also look and think and project forward, Africa has the resources more than any other place in the world. Africa has the land, uncultivated land, more than any other place in the world. Africa has water more than any other place. Africa has sunlight more than anything else. And these are going to be the most valuable commodities going forward. Everybody's going to have to come to Africa. 
<laughs> so, you know, they should start conditioning their minds that, oh, in the future, is Africa going to accept our great, great grandsons and granddaughters? Because the rest of the world is populated, is destroyed by environmental conditions, and Africa is still the most pristine environment in the world, whether we like it or not. So people like that, you just show them the facts, you know, and hopefully what I've said right now, some thinking people will accept it, and the ones that don't accept, you don't even bother with people like that because they're beyond redemption. That's how I see it. That brings me to, um, you know, just like what you said about Africa have um, the resources and stuff like that. Now, when, um, we have seen throughout, you know, ages and times where is it that the Europeans, the Americans, or now the Asians, the China right. in particular, mm -hmm. you know, um, coming in and um, weighing so much, um, you know, relevance or trying to become the leaders in in Africa, and you know, over time we, we've talked about all these things. People people have been talking, and we continue to have the same kind of leaders. Now, sometimes, yeah. um, um, you know, I see a lot of um, like now during this uh, pandemic. You see that the um, both the Chinese are coming to. They say they want to come and help, and you know we are all raising our eyebrows. Then the Europeans again are also giving huge amounts of money, and given the resources we already have, given the things that we have, you know, down home, the manpower, the natural resources, the uh, you know material resources that we have. Why is it um, still necessary or, I don't know, I don't even know how to put it, but what I'm trying to say is, um, we keep seeing these things, we keep seeing the interest from outside right. coming. Why is it difficult for our leaders to see that, you know, our, our dignity, our ownership of the land is at stake? Right. Well, it's difficult. It's not so much difficult, but, it's a level of selfishness which is beyond comprehension. Are we missing the? Are we losing the audio? Comprehension. Okay. But a few Continue. Years ago, can, can you say that again? Because you you cut off them. Oh, I'm sorry. I said you know I'll give you an example from what happened in Uganda, and I think this is widespread. The Ugandan dictator, General Yoweri Museveni, was asked by a journalist a few years ago. A Kenyan reporter asked him, and he said, uh, the demands of running a country are overwhelming. So how do you respond to this? And you know what he said, <laughs> and it's on YouTube. People can go and look it up. He said, I don't care. He said, all I care about is myself, my family, and my grandchildren. This is the president of a whole country. And that to me reveals a lot. And it's not surprising seeing some of the destruction that many of these leaders have done to our beloved continent. Because if you think like that, then obviously, it explains why we're in the condition we are in right now. You have the resources and you can leverage that, but instead you're willing to accept so-called foreign aid, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't have to work for that. You just take it. But in return, you must do something, right? To the people that give the foreign aid you literally mortgage your country, right? And they've been comfortable doing that, just mortgaging Africa, Africa's interest, you know? And that's what they do. Because you're right, I agree with you. Number one, we should not be needing a dime from these countries. And that has perpetuated that sense of dependency 
over the decades, six decades of dependency, right? Just think about it. But when your own system is not functioning, then of course, you'll probably have to take it. Because right now, for example, when you're telling people to stay at home in an African country, when you know that you don't have like, like the US Treasury Department, they could just sign a check and send thousands of dollars to the citizens of the United States. You're not in a position to do that, you know, in an African country, because your level of economic development due to your own mismanagement and abuse does not allow you to do that. Are you going to just print money? When you just print money and it's not backed by the level of economic in development, you know what that does. That brings inflation, right? <laughs> inflation. So everybody will have money with nothing to buy because the prices will just be exorbitant. So therefore, your only alter alternative now is to take the handouts wherever they come from. It's so shameful. And that goes back to explain that comment of seeing dead bodies in Africa as well. Because everybody presumes that Africa and Africans are always going to be begging. And they don't realize that, in fact, it is Africa that is subsidizing their high standard of living. As we discussed in one of your shows, without the resources from West Africa and North Africa, countries like Niger, France would not be. Uh, as, classified as a developed country today. And that is just one example. You know, so we are subsidizing the world at the same time being abused <laughs> verbally by the world and then given handouts that we actually should not even need. That's the contradiction. But many Africans are now thinking of the things that we're discussing right now, which means the door is open to change the structure of African governments fundamentally. And we want to do it in an orderly way, but there will be change. Because now, when you see countries like Kenya, which compared to many African countries, is developed a relatively modernizing economy. Uh, Rwanda. Even that, you see people fighting for food, imagine, in Kenya. So think about the countries that are not even as developed as Kenya is. Imagine what is going to happen in those countries. It means we are going to see some social upheaval in the weeks and the months going forward. And in some cases, it could lead to changes of government. But if it leads to a change of government under chaotic conditions, and the, the next government that comes into being is even less efficient than the one that you remove, then that is not going to help anybody. That is why it's important for us to continue the conversation we are having right now and spread it in uh, conscious African communities all over the continent. They must be a part of changing the governments in their country. They're, they have a right to be in government. Before, before the so-called independence in the 1960s, right? The people who became the first generation of leaders, they were not leaders before they became leaders, but they evaluated the environment. They said, our people are ready to get rid of the Europeans. And if we get rid of the Europeans, we, including I myself, should step into leadership. So what I'm saying is that we now, having conversation like the one we're having right now, should say that Africa is ready for change. Let's get off, rid of the corrupt leadership who caters to the interests of outsiders, not of Africa, so that we can become the new leadership. That's how we should be thinking. To, to add to what you said, and um, to, to, you know, to give some credit as well to some of our leaders, to some of African leaders, um, I was reading today that um, Ghana, you know, has not recorded, I think recorded less than uh, uh, 200 more cases or so, and, uh, and two deaths 
and now they've had to lift their um, lockdown uh, to restart the, the economy. Also, uh, Madagascar um, has not recorded any more cases and deaths. And I think they, they, they found a kind of cure using their natural um, local um, herbs or something like that, which, which the nation has you know, recognized. But I haven't heard anything about that any other place, not even in the AU, the AU, the African um, um, uh, media or organizations, right. have, you know, none of them have um, endorsed that um, remedy that, that, you know, that's been found in Madagascar. 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 Then right. also the, um, was it like Kenya that you mentioned? Um, the the Uhuru Kenyatta, he mm -hmm. um, recently, and I, I never heard about that here, but I read that um, the British uh, scientists and stuff, they wanted to go, they were discussing, they, they made it public that they were going to test the vaccine, their vaccine in Kenya, without, first of all, discussing with the government of Kenya, and they went public with that. But now um, I, I found out that um, I read that Kenya, the Kenyatta has said, you know, has um, dismissed that and said um, Ken Kenyans are not going to become their, you know, um, guinea pigs. So, you know, these are, you know, at least a few, you know, places where there is a little bit of light coming in, which right. we need to encourage and you know we all need to be you know loud in their their efforts and encourage them to do better to do to continue to do better so that other all the other ones lagging lagging behind can catch up and you know set up that positive competition within the nation and the continent so okay i, I so, mm -hmm. one moment you know i like the statements you made um when you stated that uh, 19 theses where uh, the pioneers and Pan-Africanists, you know, they were able to come together and uh, drive out the Europeans. Yep. And that opportunity has come for us, the younger ones, now to take similar decision and, uh, and see how we can get rid of the, the, the these old politicians and leaders, you know, because yeah. You know they've been the scar on the on the on the palm. You know they right. they've been doing some damages, uh, both um, human and uh, uh, natural resources to Africa. So I think going back with what we have now with the social media, the revolution that is going on now, I would like you to throw in light how. Um, the impact of social media, you know, and the revolution in the uh, digital communication, you know, mm -hmm. how it has really, you know, changed the dynamics whereby we can now ask our leaders, you know, we can now see the relationship between uh, uh, the leaders and the followers. How right. this, uh, you know, how the, 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 the equation has changed because now right. we are now comfortable in pressing our leaders to account for what is going on in Africa or in right. respective countries. Okay, very good. Okay, so to begin with first, in terms of, uh, of Ghana, yes, I, uh, I follow also developments in Ghana. I saw the uh, statement by the president in terms of easing up, but still making sure that the safety procedures are followed. Um, and Ghana is, of course, one of the better performing economies in Africa. So Ghana is able to do that. In fact, Ghana's economy is even uh, stronger than Kenya's, uh, I believe. So countries like Ghana and Kenya uh, can take some of those uh, more progressive measures, including uh, the announcements of easing uh, some of these uh, restrictions and of course there's a pressure to ease these restrictions because as I said in the beginning of the show many African countries don't have the social safety net money 
that is just there on reserve for emergencies such as this. So there's pressure on them for the economy to be able to operate. And we saw in Kenya, I think Tanzania as well, the president is also, also wants to ease up uh, some of the restrictions. And there's a debate there. You know, some people are concerned and saying, you know, is it time to do that in Tanzania? But the president is saying in Tanzania, look, it's on, not only on behalf of Tanzania, but the neighboring countries that rely on Tanzania. These are landlocked countries that don't have access to the coast. So if we lock down too severely in Tanzania, we're also affecting uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, we are affecting Rwanda, we are affecting Burundi, and we're also affecting Uganda and some other landlocked countries. So that's a very strong argument. So obviously there's pressure. Uh, what do we do in terms of the balance between the restrictions and the easing up of some of the conditions? So we have to follow that and see how it plays out. In terms of uh, uh, Madagascar, Madagascar also, of course, has the advantage of being able to police its borders. You know, it's an island, so you can't just sneak into the country. They can more easily monitor uh, the people that are coming in, and that would explain why the rates uh, could be relatively much lower than otherwise. And in terms of the remedy that they have there, I would not really refer to it as a, as a cure. And I'm glad you used the word remedy. Because it seems something like this, if it's already invaded your body, you're going to need much more serious levels of intervention. But as you know, this disease adversely impacts the most people with weakened immune systems. So I would not be shocked uh, if this uh, remedy they're referring to is something that actually boosts the immune system and, um, and makes you much more strong and resistant uh, toward this, uh, this coronavirus disease. And uh, maybe that, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure if that uh, boost would work for, for everybody because of course the difference in, in, in genetics. But you also raise uh, a bigger question uh, by bringing up that issue. As you know, most or many of the drugs or pharmaceuticals that are used in these industrialized countries, uh, the ingredients come from African countries anyway. And we have many natural cures for many diseases that remain unknown, unexplored, because in, as part of this kind of dependency that we've developed uh, in terms of our relationship with the West and the industrial world, we reject everything that is Africa. So we don't even know some of the things we have. <laughs> our, our ancestors, before their engagement with the West, when people felt ill, people felt sick, they didn't just watch them die. No, they knew there were many cures in many of these plants that we have, these plants, these trees, and what have you. And they knew a wide range of medicines, natural medicines, to combat these diseases. So can you imagine if at independence 60 years ago, every African country, and they, at that time it was the Organization of African Unity, now it's the AU, had made it a point that we are going to invest X amount of millions of dollars into researching all of these natural ingredients that we have in our plants to treat all these diseases. Can you imagine? Number one, we will have so many types of medicines for various diseases, not only for Africans, but to sell to the world. Many of these medicines, quote unquote medicines, that now many African countries cannot even afford. The ingredients come from African countries. So just think about that, it's mind boggling. It should be the other way around. <laughs> it should be Africa that is selling these types of cures to the rest of the world and making the billions of dollars that now we spend 
to buy medicines that are sometimes not even appropriate for us. They have side effects. You know, they may cure something, but they may create another type of disease. Uh, also, you mentioned Kenya. I want to mention one other thing about Kenya that I heard. You brought up the aspect of the possible testing of vaccines. That should be a no-no. And I think now, and the only good thing I can say that came out of those two French doctors, those racist fools that made that statement about testing uh, the vaccine in Africa, because people are poor and they don't know, the only good thing that came out of that, it became part of a wide conversation. So now Africans in every African country are now more alert and they're more aware. And should they hear that any African president is entertaining the idea of making his people guinea, uh, guinea pigs, it's not going to happen. Because not only would, be, would it be the citizens of that one country reacting, but all of Africa will come and denounce that president and Africans in the diaspora will do the same. One other thing I was reading in the Kenyan media was that uh, Kenyan companies have come up with uh, ventilators, the producing ventilators that are designed and made in Kenya. So we, we need to give more publicity to that. And if there are resources uh, uh, to have that made available to more African countries coming from Kenya. So that was one good thing that I read about Kenya. Now, in terms of social media, which was, I think, the last question you, you asked. Yes. I agree with you totally. I made a short, uh, I think it was less than four minute uh, video, my reaction to uh, the attacks against Africans in China. And I put that on my Facebook page. And now it's been shared. Now I'm getting messages from Tanzania, messages from Ghana, messages from South Africa, and messages from Africans in other parts of the diaspora. They're inviting me to join their conversations. They're inviting me to uh, see their website, uh, asking me if they can post it on the website. I said, of course. And this is just one short four minute uh, video. And in that video, I'm saying what I've been saying over here. I said basically that the thing we're seeing happening in China is because the, Afri the, the, the perception of Africa is universally uh, uh, negative, universally. And that's because of the historical conditioning during the, the period of enslavement, the pe period of colonization, and even in the period after colonization. I said that, but I said, part of the problem is that even though that period was critical in demonizing Africans, diminishing the value of African life, Africa essence, many of our misrulers continue to do the same thing. So how would we be shocked if Africans are abused outside Africa? If in Africa, misrulers are abusing Africans and we tolerate that, we cannot be outraged about Africans being abused in China before we are outraged by Africans being abused in Uganda, in South Sudan, in uh, Equatorial Guinea, in uh, Togo, in all these countries where you still have these reactionary dictatorships, you know? So that's, I, I, I said that, and I was hoping it, it, was, it would resonate. And I must say, I'm even more surprised at the level of how much is resonating. Which, which is to say that we are on the right track in terms of uh, knowing that Africans want change. They're tired of lip service. And I don't think this time they're going to give any misruler any more excuse. Because first of all, now, these misrulers cannot run to the West. You know, <laughs> We will make sure we follow them to the West. They will not be able to steal our money and hide it in the West because we will follow and we'll demand those resources be returned, you know? And now they are also realizing how vulnerable they are. For example, if there were to be an upheaval right now in some of these countries, they can't run to Europe, right? In fact, it may not even be easy for them to run to another African country given their 
travel restrictions. So now for the first time, some of them are thinking, you know what? I may have to deal with my people, <laughs> which is something they should have been doing all along anyway, right? Mm -hmm. But now they're forced to start thinking, I may have to deal with my people because I may not be able to run anywhere. And with us, as you pointed out, with the power of social media, we can demand that they deal with our people. In the old days, they had the monopoly on information. They controlled the radio station. But now, your smartphone can become your radio station, you see? So now, they cannot mon monopolize the conversation. They cannot suppress information. Uh, we are in a unique position. We are ready for a fundamental change. We change from the, 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 the pigmentation of the people who are running the country. But now we want beyond pigmentation. We want real changes, economies that benefit us, healthcare system that benefit us, education that benefit us. That's what we need in Africa, and we can do it. I'm very confident we can do it. Exactly. The, like you rightly said, um, first and foremost, the, there is a point um, you raised here about uh, the Africans. You know, before, they, they were able to uh, develop remedy for all the diseases. And if the pioneers or the leaders before had you know advised them to invest on those area then we would have developed you know our skills and technology and other ways of you know commercializing this um medicine absolutely and uh, as far as i'm concerned i i am i believe in uh, people developing their own skills and their uniqueness yes so because there is no way we can stop the racism or stop um, Chinese people messing us up, except when we can now begin to do things for ourselves. Right. And how do we start doing things ourselves? Is first of all, Af for Africans to begin to understand that the, 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 their destiny is in their hand. Yes. And they possess enormous power. They possess the, 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 this power of uniqueness. You know, there are areas where Africans are good. Yes. And if we invest in, on those areas and develop those areas, then we have something value we can offer to other people. Because yep. why they are looking at us in this manner is because they they've seen a vacuum in the, in the in the in the in the business world which africans are supposed to yep. feel but africans are not feeling it absolutely so with the help of the social media the awareness is coming like i just said the awareness is coming people are now begin to uh, are beginning to understand that look they have responsibility of being productive they have responsibility of not depending on foreign heads and foreign yep. governments in order to live their life. So if we are able to harness the resources we already have, develop it, then we can package it and sell it to these people. And now we can now discuss with them on equal terms. As of yep. now, we're not discussing with them on equal terms. The only right. way we can achieve that is when we are as productive as they are yes um can if i can come in from there um also um you know before a people reach a state of being productive yep has to be foundation if you watch yep. the past um, um decades like six decades for example since um independence and all that started happening in theory um you find out that the um, our style of education is not preparing the the young minds, the, the upcoming minds, it's not preparing them to be leaders, 
is not preparing them to be productive. It's not preparing yes. them to, you know, look within, you know, yes. and the school system only prepares us for learning how to write CV. You know, I used to act all the time, you know, in every, every nation, the government, you know, only employs, provides employ, employment, government employ, uh, provides employment for only about, um, not up to 10% of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the right. population. Mm -hmm. So it's usually private sector that provides the massive, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, deploys and, you know, engages the, the workforce, not really the government. So the only thing government does to, is to create the enabling environment right. so that mm -hmm. businesses can thrive and then be able to employ more people. Now, an average African youth is not trained to be a leader in the first place, right. to lead himself. He's right. not even trained to be able to see opportunities to create, you know, to create business for them. Right. You know, so an average African is looking for cash. Right. He's looking for easy way of getting money. Instead of looking for easy, looking for ways to create, to, to, to grow, right. to build. Right. So we don't we, we need to begin to address that area and start telling our youth the importance of you know commercializing their talent, not knowing how to you know make their talent into a job. Stop looking at the government for jobs. Stop, you know, so that right. people begin to know that our the power is in our hands. Yes, and I agree. When we can empower ourselves, then the government automatically, you know, the people in the, 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 the political elite, the the, the, the the standard now yeah, goes I agree. above what they have, so that they now have to sit up. You know, myself personally, I get so um, I, I get so the uh, disgusted and angry and sometimes when i see even the body language of some of the people who call themselves leaders in africa right. for example <laughs> there are some of these um, nigerian senators when you see them posting their pictures on social media and you know like facebook twitter and all that sometimes you wonder do they really understand what the position they occupy what it means right. Right. And they're doing pageantry. Do they think they're models? Do they think right. they are, you know, hooligans? You know, just right. sometimes right. I don't want to mention names, but there's a particular one that I had to actually send him, reply him, and ask him, "What I, what do you think you are doing on social media?" Right. right. You know, the, the the what he posted was something about um, uh, we have we are not counting money before we spend. And then he's showing off his house and you know how you know just take a picture and post it on Twitter. And yeah. I wrote him, I said, You're a senator for Christ's right. sake of a country. At this point in time, very good. At this point in time, when there's pandemic, we are supposed to be talking about what to do. Nobody Absolutely. is interested in, in Absolutely. whether you're counting your money or not. We want to see you as a senator leading and showing what to do and you know tackling some of the issues that we have in the right. country addressing those issues talking about the hospitals are they functional i received right. a video this evening where one of the nigerians um um, 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 um specialist hospitals government specialist hospitals in, Edo, right. in particular Edo Bini City, you know is completely empty just like a warehouse that nothing is happening People right. are there, patients are there, there are no doctors, there is no light, there are no furniture, right. nothing. Right. And this is supposed to be a specialist hospital in, Nigeria, yeah. in a place called Nigeria, which is supposed to be the giant of Africa. And Absolutely. when you see such things, and then we come on social media and make noise that Chinese are coming to take our land. What are right. we doing with the land that we already, that we have? What are we doing with the things we have? If we are not using it, it doesn't, if it doesn't make any meaning to us and somebody sees it and finds it of value and wants to use it, the person has to, you know, after all, done anything wrong. Right. No, I agree with you totally. Both of what you're saying, they're very interrelated. And I'm very glad we're having this conversation, you know, because we are discussing the ailments 
the fundamental ailments that uh, holds back our beloved continent. And of course, it starts with the mindset. It starts with education. Because you can only demand in this world as much as you believe you're entitled to. Yes. You can only create for yourself in this world as much as you believe you're capable of creating, right? And we know our people are capable of creating. You can go to any village, you will see creativity and talent at its most basic, basic form. I, I imagine you can go to any African village and you'll find young kids below the age of 10 who will cut out wheels from wood. They will cut out a frame, a stick from a tree, and they will fix the mechanical system to create these cars that are so ubiquitous all over Africa. I was always very impressed by that, you know? They didn't need some toys coming from a Western factory, no. And then sometimes they, they, they create their own dyes and they paint it in various colors. This is a tremendous level of creativity that if we had more smart leaders in positions of power, to see that this is a type of creativity that results in engineering innovations. And you would support it with resources instead of stealing uh, uh, national money and putting it in some European bank. So I say this to say that the conditions are there, the ingredients are there, but it needs to be channeled in the right way. And you're right, education is fundamental. And our education systems, uh, I think it was Julius Nyerere, the late president of Tanzania, who said, education that does not allow the person to enhance and maximize their skills is not education. It's an education that is conditioning them uh, in an environment of mental enslavement. And he's 100% right. And uh, Milka Cabral, who, lead, who led the struggle for independence for Guinea-Bissau against Portugal, sadly was killed in 1973, one year before they won the struggle. And he also pointed out in his writings that the European educational system was specifically geared so that even after they left, and, and they wrote about it, and he was quoting uh, uh, the person that created uh, Alliance Francais, that he specifically wrote that our education system should be in such a way that when we leave, the people that end up running, the Africans that end up running, would be spiritually and mentally French. <laughs> and we are seeing that manifestation up to today in the 21st century, in terms of how in many West African former French colonies, the mind is still spiritually and mentally French because they designed it that way. They knew what they were doing, right? So we have to challenge that and it can be done. It can be done very quickly because Africans are waiting for it. And why do I say it can be done very quickly? Because we know the proof is there. What happened in Burkina Faso? Thomas Sankara had only 1983 when he came to power, so 84. 85, 86, 87, four years. But he changed Burkina Faso fundamentally because he opened up the African mind. He said, first of all, we should be independent psychologically and mentally and create our own. And as he said, when he attended the uh, Organization African Unity meeting in, uh, in July, 1987, that's the year he was also killed. He said, we must consume what we create in Africa. And we must create what we consume in Africa. And he was talking about what you just brought up right now. In terms of us 
creating and producing our own products. We have all the natural ingredients. But in order to do that, we have to first, and I say this, it sounds like something flippant, but it's not. We have to engage our people and remind them and insist that they love Africa. They love Africa. Because once they do that, and they understand how much energy that unleashes, once you do that, the Europeans that demonize Africans for no reason, because they just like calling Africans savages? No, of course not. There was a specific purpose for doing that. Number one, by demonizing Africans, then they could justify the massacres, the genocidal uh, killings of Africans to, to plunder their resources. They could justify it to other Europeans in their own home countries. Because then the Europeans in their countries would say, wait, why are you killing all these people? They would not say that because their mind would say, oh, yes, they're killing, but those aren't really people like us. So that was one reason for the demonization. But the other reason was to diminish the self-esteem of Africans. And that has been very effective. The inferiority complex to think only good things, that only the things that are good must come from Europe. It cannot be created by an African. We always second guess an African. An African cannot create something. An African cannot invent something. An African cannot discover something. So that is very deep seated in the African mind. So we have to cure that first. And that goes back, as you said, to education. And thankfully with social media, we can engage in this kind of conversation we are having right now and disseminate it widely and tell our African youth that no, in fact, many of these countries are advanced But at some they were precisely at the same level of underdevelopment that we are in right now. And what happened historically? It started with England, primarily. England plundered resources <laughs> from other parts of the world. Uh, they just happened to be more ruthless than other people. And then other European powers followed the same. So when you Plunder, as you know, if you go to your neighbor and you steal all your neighbor's resources, you are going to be in a better position than your neighbor going forward for a very, very long time. And that is how they are able to industrialize and to create some of this wealth that we now see in Europe by extracting from Africa. It's no accident. Had that historical plunder not happened, they would not be in those positions we will all pretty much be on a relatively uh, level position. So obviously this is not something that everybody can comprehend very quickly, but gradually they can comprehend. But what they can comprehend quickly is the need for us to produce our own. Look, you know, when you wear like an African shirt like this, for example, here in the United States, in New York, European Americans come to compliment me on my shirt and to ask me where they can get that shirt. This is just one example of one product that we can create. And now with social media, with marketing, I don't see why every summer I, I should not see everybody in New York wanting to wear a shirt like this, including European Americans. And it can be done. With marketing, you marketing, the, our young people know how to do marketing. You get the right people to start wearing it. Let's say we get a few of these uh, Hollywood stars to start wearing this, a few of the athletes to start wearing this, more than some of the notable political figures start wearing this, then it catches just like that. And that would be one product. And we can do, we can do this for many other types of African products. And then this is what 
you ask another question of what else can we do for our young people? I saw a article in a Uganda newspaper. This young lady, uh, she's now 26, but I think she has been doing this business for three years now. And she has other two other young ladies as her partners. And when we get off uh, the show, I will send you some information about this young lady. And I told her that I'm going to have some of my writers interview her so we can feature her on Black Star News. And at some time, because I also have a radio show uh, here in New York City on WBAI radio every Tuesday, I may find a way to interview her, provided the technological challenges are not so overwhelming. I might be able to connect her by Zoom or Skype and have her on the radio show. So what is she doing? They go around and they collect plastic garbage bags that have been discarded from the landfills. They take hundreds, thousands of these bags and they clean it and then they press it. They've come up with the basic machines to press it into clear plastic and then they create artwork, very beautiful artwork. And then they use this to make school bags for children. And they're beautiful, with beautiful artistic designs. So beautiful, and it has recyclable content that not only would she be able to expand her market domestically in Uganda, but would even be able to export this to some of these industrialized countries where the younger people are now becoming much more conscious when it comes about issues of the environment. I can see them importing a bag like this. So these are the kind of young creative Africans that we need to identify and to help them in any way we can. You know, I will be more than happy to contribute a little money to her effort and to help her even raise more funding to expand uh, her enterprise and get other young uh, ladies and young men to create these kind of businesses in Uganda. And this is just one example for indigenous domestic businesses using domestic resources that we can promote. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm happy that you, you, you said something about um, funding and all that uh, in terms of business and um, expansion for you know, African businesses, which um, for long has been, even us in the diaspora, has been one of the major um, major problems that uh, you know, few people who who have the the mindset or the the who want to try their you know hands on you know doing businesses and all that, we are quickly you know run over by other competitors because of lack of funding. And right. also because of the issue of what you said about, um, you know, us people, Africans not liking, you know, whatever is of African. Right. You know, so for example, um, I don't know, you, you can be, uh, you, you can, you can evidently, you know, uh, compliment this because um, in the media, as you know, you might write the same article. Right. Even better presented. And <laughs> you find your people sharing and engaging with the foreign one. In fact, when they right. read anything from yours, then they're first of all going to go and check if right. other people have confirmed it before they believe yes. that it's true. You know, so it's so worrying that um, many Africans want to see themselves in good light. Then when they see their own media projecting them in that light that they want, they're not interested until they see right. you on either CNN or, I keep telling many people that see, what makes a media, a mainstream media, is the number of people who are consuming their, you know, their news right. and their broadcast. So if your own media, you're not loyal to them, you are not engaging with it. They will right. never command the influence that you're looking for. And of course, right. CNN uh, and on any other Western media, they already had their agenda before they started. And you are not their primary positive agenda. Therefore, you are always going to be the scapegoat that they, they will use in driving, you know, whatever agenda their government wants. 
right. you know, it hurts me a lot to see that all over Africa, you see the, the BBC, which is a British broadcasting corporation, has right. taken over the, you know, the, the, the media space in the whole of Africa, using all the languages. Then it makes you to wonder what is happening to our indigenous national, uh, you know, even the ones that government sponsors, like NTA, Nigeria Television Authority, what are they doing? Why would they be there? And BBC is occupying such huge space, speaking in right. Europe by using in, uh, um, um, now they have pigeon English, they have uh, Igbo channels, um, they also have their uh, what's it called the Hausa, you right. know. So they occupy huge space, and they are, course. you know, and they are the ones um, driving the the the, the narrative. Yep. And that is very easy. Once, uh, uh, once somebody is able to capture the airspace of any nation, yep. they command who leads. They are the ones who are putting the leaders because what people hear, you know, and what people get to know is what they believe. So, right. and these are the things, the areas I want to really hammer on to our people right. see until right. we begin to support our own. Until we begin to, British people will say, put your money where your, where yes. your mouth is. Until right. we begin to put our money where our mouth is, you know, I we'll continue to be the ones looking for jobs. You know, I and looking you. for jobs where you are going to be rejected. We are still going to be the ones at the bottom of every ladder, begging for the crumbs. So yeah. it's high time, you know, Africans, wherever we are, even in the diaspora, you know, to begin to sit up and look beyond, even when you're earning salary, make sure, ask yourself when you spend your money, check yourself, 80% yes. of the money I'm, I'm earning, where am I spending it? How is it circulating within my, com my community? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not when we get money, fam, it goes out. The same thing we are talking about our leaders, we are doing it ourselves. We don't, we yes. find it difficult to buy from each other, the, the, once, once, um, the, once an African buys from you, they want to become your friend. You know, yeah. they now want to go beyond that customer business relationship. They now want to become personal business and from there, nothing works. You know, so we need to, we really need to get up. We need to, you know, begin to understand this thing and how it's affecting everybody. Yeah, you know, as I'm listening to you, I'm making notes here, and I'm saying, you know, you've now encouraged me to write a book with the title, The African Bible of Entrepreneurship. <laughs> because I know I agree, totally, and I'm serious about it. I would like to contribute. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we could do it actually as a, as a joint effort, you know? But you're right, uh, and it goes back to the mind. We have to decolonize the mind, really. I remember I was working for a paper called The City Sun many years ago in Brooklyn. That's way before I even founded Black Star News. So it must have been before 1997 because that's when I started Black Star News. And I did a story about a, uh, an incident that happened in an in a elementary school where four uh, four or five European Americans took an African American student, and you know this was part of bullying. And they dug a hole in the ground, and they stuck his head in it, and they were burying him. And it was only at some stage that you know he was struggling that a teacher came and intervened. Otherwise, this young kid would have been killed by other young kids. So we wrote the story in the City Sun was an African-American owned publication. And a reporter from one of the so-called mainstream newspapers called me and said, oh, I just read your story. He said, is this a true story? <laughs> Can you imagine him calling a reporter at the New York Times or the Daily News and asking that question, is this a true story? And 
To make matters worse, the reporter who asked me that question was an African-American. <laughs> so we would manufacture a story like that and publish it in a newspaper and put it out on newsstands. And I would have my name on that story, my byline. Just, just think about that thought. So I, that sums pretty much a lot of what, 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 what you're saying. And obviously, we know how many times the BBC, CNN, the New York Times have been so wrong on many big stories that I don't even need to mention any, but I would like to mention one in particular. On Rwanda, for example, and on the Congo, you know, the New York Times basically ignoring and allowing a, the, the, the genocide in Rwanda and in Congo to not be adequately reported. Because at that time, it's not so much today, but at that time, the Ugandan dictator was very close to the West. So they basically did not want to expose his role in all of that. That it was because of his militarism, you know, invading Rwanda in 1990. Without that invasion, there would never have been a, a, a genocide in 1994. Invading Congo, the same thing. But they're not reporting it adequately, because they know reporting it adequately he would end up being in, in front of the International Criminal Court, because that is a US agent. So imagine a big newspaper like the New York Times. So if the New York Times is not reporting it, the BBC is not reporting it, CNN is not reporting it. If anybody else reports it, even fellow Africans will have a very skeptical attitude. If this is really the true story, why is it not in the New York Times? Why is it not in CNN? Why is it not on BBC? You see? So that is part of the challenge. Not only do, they, do our people end up rejecting our own journalism, but the fact that, I mean, they, they, they end up not embracing our journalism, but the fact that the so-called mainstream are not reporting it, they start repudiating our journalism. They start doubting everything we report because the big things we claim is happening is not being reported by those guys. So now, those big guys are also diminishing the acceptance of the truth that we expose. But we have to keep at it. We have no choice but to keep at it. And that's why I'm a, I'm a big fan of investigative type journalism. When you link with, uh, with the evidence, and I'll give you one very quick story. In 2014, when the foreign minister of Uganda was about to become the president of the UN General Assembly, he ended up getting that position. But we did a story showing that he had a private company in Uganda. He did not tell the UN that he, that company belonged to him. He got a UN contract, and he ended up getting doing business with the UN worth $30 million which he was not entitled to because it's a conflict of interest. You can't be foreign minister on a private company and have a contract with the UN, no. <laughs> so we did the story. Obviously, the story would not have been believed if we did it and nobody else was doing it. But what helped was that we were able to link to the invoices that his company submitted to the UN with the letterhead of his company. Which, where was it? It was on the website of the United Nations. <laughs> so we linked to all of that, right? Yeah. He, still got, he still got the job because the US was still supporting Uganda. So he got the job. But what he didn't know was that the FBI started investigating him on corruption because I called the FBI to get a comment on the story. So even though they declined to comment, they started investigating him. They tapped his phone. And then even after he already stole 30 million, he came to the, to the United Nations, he started negotiating another bribe with a Chinese individual who wanted oil concessions for a Chinese energy company. Eventually, when he went back to Uganda, the Chinese guy was arrested. He was tried in 2018 and convicted of bribing not only Uganda's foreign minister, but also bribing the president of, of Uganda. 
And we did that. And now everybody else reported the story. Uh, CNN, New York Times, BBC, Washington Post, Financial Times. Anybody can Google it. His name is uh, Sam Kutesa, K-U-T-E-S-A. That story started with what we reported in 2014, before everybody else wrote about it in 2018, when the U.S. actually brought a case against the Chinese who bribed them. Why did the U.S. do it? Because the Chinese who bribed them used a New York City-based bank to wire some of the bribe money. <laughs> That's how the U.S. got jurisdiction. So even the stories that they do not want to do, we can do it and force all of them to do it if we do it the right way. And we have to teach more of our journalists the skills of doing this type of investigative journalism so that even the small guys can become big players now. So it can be done, you see? Sure. Uh, I'm trying to, to see if there were any other issues that you raised that I made notes that I might have forgotten. Uh, let me see. Yeah, yeah. we'll be, it's true. We'll be rounding up now. Yeah, it's the, the, the colonizing the mind is the key thing. Uh, my yeah, sister. Like, like you said, um, it's all about decolonizing the mind, but my joy and my happiness is that uh, things are moving now in a positive direction because of social media. Yes. Uh, imagine uh, Postina, the, the editor of Seahawk uh, uh, Magazine, and myself, the publisher, we, you know, right. we, without the social media, we would not unite right. as the way we are doing. Absolutely. And, uh, yes. So, Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, because you see, I believe that it's little things that matter. You know, yeah. uh, as we're engaging in this kind of uh, discu a discussion, you know, is making impact. You know, absolutely. Uh, by the time and you know me, it, let me give you one other quick example. How do I know that it's working? Yeah. Because afterwards, yeah. an official of the Ugandan government came to New York yeah. and wanted to have dinner with me. And I went and I had dinner, but I made sure my brother came along too, because they're very funny for, to do, for doing things with people's food, you know? Yeah. So I had my brother with me. I said, if I go to the men's room, keep your eyes on my food. So then I'm wondering, what is this guy? Why does he want to meet? So then he says, oh, if His Excellency offers you a position in the government, what would you say? I would say, listen, what I do is not on behalf of me. It's not on behalf of you. Yeah. It's not on the behalf of your boss. Mm. What I'm doing is because I want us as Africans to build institutions so that when I'm not here, when you're not here, when your boss is not here, we are functioning institutions. That's why I do this. And then he asked me, he said, oh, how do you finance your Black Star News? <laughs> so now he's talking money, you know? I said, listen, I finance it by the people who care about the kind of journalism I do and they want to support it. I said, okay, well, anyway, here's my card. If you want to continue discussion, you can contact me. I'm here for two more weeks. Of course, I never got in touch with him again because they think they can cor corrupt everybody. No. But we must not allow that. We must not allow that, you know? The, 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 what you're saying, you see, see what, that's the problem with uh, the, the, the more Africans begin to understand their responsibility and their role, the better for us because, uh, because yes. life is about legacy. And yes. like yes. I came I to know you, you know, I've uh, struck a, a, a relationship based on your, your work Thank and you. your integrity. So Thank you. people think it's going to end here. It's not going to end here. Even after we've left this world, it's gonna continue. Right. So that's why we're Absolutely. saying legacy is important because it is, not the, it is not how much you made, but it is the impact you made. And impact Absolutely. doesn't depend on how large. You, the, the minimal difference you make lives forever. So right. I, we, I, uh, I and Faustina are encouraging uh, Africans in UK here to follow the lead. and to start doing something different. Yep. Because yep. money is not African problem. The problem of Africa is ignorance. 
Absolutely. <laughs> That's the I'm best way to put to say, it. But... So anytime we we begin to understand things we are not understanding, then we begin to take leadership position. And once right. we begin to take leadership position, our problem is solved. Yes, so, and we can do it. We can do it. Thank so now you. I have I, okay. I have another show, but I'm very happy we had this conversation. And let me know when the next one is, and I'm always ready. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Stay strong. Uh, yes. Stay strong and stay healthy. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you. Thank you so uh, much. Stay well. Meeting <laughs> Alimadi. You, okay. Thank you. You you've been very very you know helpful in communicating you, this uh, COVID nineteen because. It is not only about COVID-19, but COVID-19 has really exposed a lot of things. Open a wider door. I agree, and, a bigger door. And, and now inspiring the younger ones to take the lead. And that is what we are seeing today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, comrades. Stay strong, both of you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.